successful. No, I intend to be successful. You, that's that's why you guys, it's not that's you guys, we're live. Hey, everybody. This is This Week in Science. We are live. You have come into the middle of a conversation. That's awesome. We're already having fun here. So I have a feeling tonight will be a, at least a slightly entertaining program. If you were confused as to where you are, this is This Week in Science, and uh, we are about ready to... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer! A mind is a wonderful thing to have. Without a mind, we could not see, hear, touch, smell, or contemplate the world around us. It gives us a memory of the past, our awareness of the present, and can allow us to predict even future events. Without a mind... We would have no sense of self or others or really anything at all. So imagine for a moment that you have lost your mind. Not by degrees, not a little memory loss or a few false beliefs irrefutable by fact. And not entirely either. Let's not turn ourselves into vegetative states for this. But imagine that each day that you wake up, you have no memory of yesterday's events. No idea of what tomorrow may bring. You would interact with the objects around your home as if for the first time, turning a door handle for the first time, discovering both how it operates and a brand new area to explore beyond it. A sink might be a source of cool, refreshing water or a searing hot spring that burns to the touch, depending on how it is first turned on. Discovering the refrigerator would provide food for that day, providing it survived the day before. The canned goods, canned goods in the cupboard, would likely remain there untouched, too complicated a task of identification and extraction for one day's mind. Where would you even begin to look for a device that could open one? What would it look like? What if it isn't a device at all, but a large human-eating creature made of cans? The stove? The stove would be curious, potentially dangerous. If you figure out how to turn it on and manage not to burn yourself, still the question will persist, what is it there for? Is it there for heat? Is it there for light? A world without science is very much like a world with no memory. Very little advancement is possible. For science is a recorded memory of one-day explorations into the world, with each new day adding more and more to our critical understanding of the universe so that one day, seeking out signals of other planets orbiting stars millions of light years away, will seem as normal and achievable an act as opening a can of soup. Get your mental can openers ready. It's time once again for This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening. Good science to you, Kirsten and Blair. Good science to you, too, Justin. Woohoo! We're back in full triage, right? <laughs> <laughs> the trio triage mode. And it is This Week in Science. We are here with lots of science stories. We were all bouncing up and down and arguing over what stories we were going to be talking about and who's going to be telling which stories. So hopefully we'll get it all out well. Justin, what, what, what's going on over there? Let me fix my camera. <laughs> okay. Anyway, in the wonderful, wonderful science news world this week, I have uh, a bunch of stories that I think are going to be exciting. Life in the atmosphere? Found in the atmosphere? Maybe, maybe not. You know, there are some questions. Uh, additionally, how about lengthening your telomeres naturally, the healthy way? And uh, some follow-up on stories that we have been following for quite some time. Justin, what do you have? I've got, uh, what have I got? I've got dinosaurs in a wind tunnel. I've got a uh, new Toxoplasma Gandhi eye scoop. Guns, I've got financial booms, I've got seismic activities, I've got 
Uh, I've got antibiotics in the wild. I've got too many stories to fit into one single episode, but I'm going to do as, uh, my best to get them all in. Comas. Do Ooh, it. I've got a good coma. A don't unplug me story. Ooh, what? No. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Okay. A, a, a do not uh, unplug. <laughs> issue, which do which resuscitate. I, I do a do resuscitate order, which anybody who's ever heard me speak on this issue ever ever is witness. Always resuscitate, keep me plugged in, no matter what vegetative state it appears that I'm in. Yeah, we've and had this, this conversation be before. And finally, there's going to be a story that may may back up my long term play. The long-term play. All right, Blair, what did you bring? I have getting touchy-feely with plants, uh, loner birds eavesdropping on other species for their own benefit, and monogamous coelacanths. Monogamy in a coelacanth. That's right. I, I just wasn't even imagining <laughs> imagining the day that this would be a topic on our show. It's, it's <laughs> thrown us all for a loop. I can't wait to talk about it. Throwing me for a total loop. All right, everyone. So stories that we have been following for quite some time. I first wanted to jump into the brain because, you know, I kind of like it. Brain is pretty awesome. Um, last year we heard or... Um, Earlier this year, we heard a lot about the BRAIN initiative and money that was going to be thrown behind brain research by our federal government here in the United States. Um, so I guess not last year, in April, April, um, just earlier this year. And the BRAIN initiative, it is short for Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. Uh, this is a referendum that will largely be funded by NIH, but by other groups as well. Um, there's a total of $110 million in funding that are going to be handed out. There is a working group from NIH who uh, decided how they're going to be doling out $40 million of that $110 million. Um, what they have said is, we haven't made the toughest decisions yet. Okay, so you haven't made the tough decisions yet, according to uh, an... Uh, nature, but the priorities according to the Scientist magazine are performing a census of brain cell types, so finding out uh, what brain cells there are in the brain and where, linking neuronal activity to behavior, which is very difficult to do. Yeah, um, that seems... the whole there's a lot of correlation, but not the neural activity occurs and then behavior happens, kind of a yeah. causal link. So that's a really... Cascading good. event sort of yes. thing. Right. Yeah. Um, improving tools for manipulating brain circuits, which that could be good or bad, depending on how it's implemented. Uh, disseminating, implemented. No <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> disseminating knowledge on neuroscience research tools and so much more, but... Basically, the overarching goal is to understand how neural circuits interact to spur memories, emotions, and behaviors. No small feat, and I doubt that $40 million is really going to be effective at getting research very far along that path, considering how much money has already been put into neuroscience research, and we still are a long way from many uh, from answering many of these questions. Um, but at least there is, you know, there is a direction and people are focusing in a particular direction in a, uh, a cohesive group. So people are saying, let's work on this together, let's work on this together and really deciding what projects are going to get funding and how they're going to, and what, um, what might be a good area to study. So if you're interested in brain research and you're a researcher out there, you know, maybe you should think about doing a project that relates to something that, uh, the NIH is giving money for. Uh, National Science Foundation will also be giving out $20 million of the Brain Initiative mon money, and uh, DARPA additionally has $50 million. So these different groups have a whole bunch of money to give out. They haven't decided who they're going to give it to yet, but, and the uh, DARPA and NSF have not yet decided what they're going to focus on. So there's still a lot of openings here, but it's neat to see research going in that direction. Nice. Yeah. Um, additionally, in the area of brain research, we talk a lot about Alzheimer's research and uh, the tau tangles in the brain that are thought to be 
related to the development of Alzheimer's disease. So as the brain gets older, or as the brain becomes more diseased, these there are areas of the brain that um, get these protein tangles, tau protein tangles. It's like clump, a clumpy mess, and neurotransmission does not occur the way that it normally does in a healthy brain. Um, it's basically been linked because we have uh, patients who die and we see the tau tangles in their brain, but we have never been able to see tau tangles in a living brain, right? You can't cut open somebody's brain and say, hey, look, there's tau tangles. You're just fine. No, <laughs> you can't do that. But research reported in the journal Neuron um, just yesterday is amazing using a tracer molecule and positron emission tomography or PET scanning. Uh, researchers have been able to scan the brains of adults, six adults, and be able to see the extent of tangling within the brain, which is really, really neat. So if you have, now we have this potential, uh, this this mechanism, this tool to be able to to be able to look at somebody, somebody's brain who we think is coming uh, down with Alzheimer's, but we aren't exactly sure. And you can say, yeah, there are tangles, or no, there are not, or there's a small amount developing, or you have a massive amount of of tangling in your brain. Uh, what they're using is a um, is a label that crosses the blood brain brain barrier and only attaches to tau and then hangs around for the pet to scan it and so they've modified an amyloid dye to make phenyl pyridinyl butadienyl benzothiazoles benzothiazoleums or Better you than me. PBBs. <laughs> 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 so this uh, it's a <clears throat> It's a modified amyloid dye. So um, that tau is a type of amyloid protein. Uh, so this is a dye that specifically is meant to dye amyloid proteins, will dye the tau protein, but it won't dye it. It'll just link to it or attach to it. And it has a very high affinity for this uh, intracellular tau, which is where you have a problem. When you have tau tangles intracellularly inside the neuron, that's when you have... Uh, the real issues. And so they did nut, uh, rodent studies and then they did C tagged PBB into six people, three of whom were suspected to have Alzheimer's. And they found the PBB bound to the hippocampal region stronger in patients with probable Alzheimer's than in healthy individuals. Hmm. So it hmm. is, uh, it's wow, precursor to the symptoms that you can actually. Yeah, so now um, it can, now we have something that we can use for diagnosis. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Tau based fantastic. diagnosis. So amazing. I'm very excited about yeah, this. I think one of the biggest hurdles when dealing with someone with Alzheimer's is recognizing it in time. And then mm -hmm. a lot of the time they misdiagnose it at first. And then by the time you figure it out, they've been alone or not being taken care of properly for a long time. So yeah. that would be really great if you can if you can detect it way beforehand than just based on the symptoms. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there are um, there are other tau labelers that are being developed, but um, this is it's neat to see something that's actually working. It could happen. So they need more samples. They need to do more work. Um, and finally, antibiotic resistance. It's a problem. Mm-hmm. It's a big problem. CDC uh, reported this last week. Uh, they found of the 2 million plus people that are infected with antibiotic resistant bacteria in the U.S., at least 23,000 die as a result. This is according to the Scientist magazine again. Um, and they did a, co a comprehensive report uh, and have said that the majority, at least half of human antibiotic use is completely unnecessary. So we need to find out uh, different ways to um, to not use antibiotics, even though uh, there are many doctors who are reducing their antibiotic use mm. currently. And additionally, they note that antibiotic use in animals is unnecessary and inappropriate and might contribute 
They don't say it does, but it might contribute to increased drug resistance, which is also cause, causing a lot of problems. Yeah. Um, and the biggest uh, problem causing bacterium was the carbapenem resistant Enterobacteriaceae, uh, or CRE bacteria, and they are very highly resistant, and they're also one of the uh, most highly uh, contracted in hospital. Uh, MRSA is now down on the list. Hospitals have gotten much better at protecting against MRSA, but the CRE is one that's um, quite a threat uh, currently. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. So one, don't go into the hospital unless you absolutely have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and two, do not take antibiotics unless it is absolutely necessary. Absolutely. Yep. And and you know it's going to be. Uh, this is only the. This is only part of the problem. A larger part of the problem too is going to be the antibiotic soaps that we're using. Um, they did a study where they tested urban areas, places that have. Uh, sewer overflows that go back into sort of the waterways, somewhat treated water, right? It gets treated and then it goes back out into waterways and the rest of it. They did that. Nearly 800 cities in the United States use this sort of a, a system. They found that high levels of triclosan, that's the main ingredient in your antibacterial soaps, were correlated with a six-fold increase in cyanobacteria and there was additional algae die-off and the rest of it. But basically, if we are creating, not only when we use these drugs to fight a disease that's already in a human being, but if we are creating different sorts of resistances in nature, it's going to make the spread much greater. Uh, we're, we're strengthening the microbes uh, to a point where we won't be able to defend ourselves from them at some point. Because unless we come up with new methods, nanobots. Uh, nanobots. Nanobots, right? Yeah. What harm did they do? Well, the other thing too is like nanobots. But as I'm, as I'm sort of looking at this, this, they're you know, increased, uh, increased uh, resistance to antibiotic soaps and the rest. I also wonder, like, how is that? What if it's, uh, what about the beneficial bacteria? What if they become more resistant to antibacterial soaps? Wouldn't that be a good thing? I mean, wouldn't it at some point just sort of level the playing field again? I guess at some point. I mean, I don't think it'll ever be a really level playing field, though. I mean, this is all, you know, every species is trying to get to the top and have the best advantage. And yeah. <clears throat> We're, you know, mutation we are here now. To help I would, some and not I help would, others. And I would like to think humans are at the top uh, currently. <laughs> And, like, and, it, and it would behoove us to do things yeah. that would permit that to continue. <laughs> it would behoove us, yes. It would be, be very hooving. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, and I was going to, I totally didn't think about linking these stories together when I was putting them together, and I don't know why, but uh, there's um, some, there's a blood test that might be possible now to uh, detect respiratory infections and to detect whether or not they're viral or bacterial. Yeah. So you get a respiratory infection, it's either going to be viral or bacterial. Bacterial infections could use antibiotics. Viral infections, antibiotics are not going to help. And this is one of the places where antibiotics are Gets often used. over prescribed. Right, because can't tell, give it to you anyway. And take an antibiotic. If yeah. you don't feel better in a week or two, then you know it's probably Which, something different. <laughs> If you don't take anything, you'll probably feel better in a week or two anyway. Just shh. Yes. Well, anyway, uh, published in Science Translational Medicine, researchers have uh, developed a blood-based gene expression uh, test. Uh, it's a, basically how the genes that are express, expressed by a patient when they have been attacked by of a respiratory viral infection. So some virus getting in through the respiratory tract and um, the immune system reacts in a, in a particular way to viruses that is different to non-viral counterparts. So researchers um, could use this blood-based test 
basically. I mean, the, the take-home message is they could use this blood-based test now that we, a blood-based test, now that we know the gene expression signature is different. You just take a little bit of blood and do a quick test. It would probably take, uh, take less than a day, and you could find out whether or not you need antibiotics. Yes, this sounds good. Ta -da! Um, they have uh, they've got a test using a reverse transcription PCR based assay, and they validated the test on uh, individuals experimentally infected with influenza A, H3N2, or the related H1N1. Further validated the test on a set of 102 patients. Uh, presenting with a fever and a bunch of healthy volunteers and their test classified participants with experimentally induced H3N2, H1N1 infection with 100% and 87% accuracy respectively, which I think is interesting hmm. that the different flu um, subtypes gave different accuracies for this test. Uh, but the test was able to detect 89% of viral infections in the clinic with a false negative rate of only 6%, which is really good. Cool. And they were also able to identify rhinovirus versus influenza. Um, which nice! Is, yeah. This is very neat. Ooh. So, yeah, very specific treatments. This is the, this is the beginning of the age of medicine that is specific to what's wrong with you. <laughs> that's fantastic. Wait, 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 wait a second. <laughs> I thought that's what medicine did. They treated what was actually wrong with you. You're well, telling me that they're guessing? The doctors don't know that they're like, eh, it could be something that this And might you as guess. the patient can often lead them to believe whatever you want them to believe as well. Which is also yeah. kind of, um, and someone in the chat room was saying that uh, they insider asked us to stop bashing antibiotics because it's one of the best things that happened to humanity. Which in many ways is them. true. It, is it definitely it saves them. lives. This Every day, defending. antibiotics save lives. But what's oh. going to hurt us in the future is if we do it for things that don't need it. Things that right. are life or death, we definitely need antibiotics. But for things like a flu or a cold that maybe you'd get over in a few days anyway and you just really want to go to work, mm -hmm. maybe not so important. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. sort of like money. Money's a great thing. It's fun to spend. But if you do so without <laughs> certain put, putting certain limitations on yourself, you will run out of it. Same thing with our antibiotics. If we don't control how we're using them, we will run out of their effectiveness. We will overuse them. Uh, the things that they're designed to kill will no longer be killed by them. And we will go back to that world where there were no antibiotics. I don't believe yeah, I don't people to need to, to get... World. Most healthy adults don't need to go and get a full, you know, uh, full treatment of antibiotic uh, drugs to fight a cold... You just don't. You can get over it. You're gonna blow some snot. You're gonna maybe yeah, throw up, and, and then you get better. Another it's point when, too. Yeah, Go it's ahead. when it's. I was gonna say it's when a respiratory infection starts lasting for you know weeks after weeks after weeks. You know when you're when you're really seeing your quality of life deteriorate as a result of of an infection. Then you want to know: is it bacterial? Is it viral? You know, can I treat it? Can I take antibiotics and get rid of it? Yeah, if it's viral, then obviously you don't need it. So that's that. That is a very important. That's a huge. Uh, yeah, exactly. Huge the other big thing that happens a lot, I know, is that people don't finish their course of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. which exactly, which is, is making helping it happen even reanimate. faster. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're, we are very pro antibiotics on this show, but it is the you. it is the judicious use of antibiotics. Exactly. Yeah. There we right. go. By the general public. By the general public. <laughs> and their extreme everyone. judiciousness. By everyone, yeah. That's why we get a little bit concerned here talking about antibiotics just being put in the food of the animals that we eat. You know, it's nice to know I mean, what is happening there. There, yeah. there's, there's still going to be bacterial evolution there. Mutations are still happening. And then we come in contact with similar bacteria. We eat the meat. There's What's happening there? There's a lot to learn. Not good. Not good. Who's up for a story next? This is This Week in Science. 
Justin, talk about the story we want to talk about. Toxoplasma gondii. Yeah. So, we all know this, this story. It's been brought up on this show very many times. It's a parasite that uh, lives in cats, cre- uh, finishes its life cycle in cats, comes out in their feces as these little cysts, these little eggs, and gets into other stuff. Uh, if it gets into a pregnant woman, it will create, could create blindness or even death in the fetus. It uh, gets into people's brains, slows reaction times, which may be a correlative for more car accidents, uh, causes some forms of schizophrenia. Very notably, you can, you can think of the crazy cat lady that is, uh, everybody knows that they're out there. But certain forms of schizophrenia are actually toxoplasma gondii infections. Uh, they create guilt issues in women, make men more interested in novelty. They create, they do behavior changing things to human beings when we're infected with the parasite. And it is thought that about a third of the world population is infected or has been infected at some point. And they also believe this could have shaped the way entire nations uh, think philosophically based on you know the uh, majority, uh, having a majority population with the infection, that sort of thing, or larger population with the infection. So now comes this study which is going to shed a little bit of light on how long-term the effects of this sort of thing. Because the, the infection itself can be gotten rid of. This is, uh, oh, in, in this study they're looking at cats. They're looking at uh, cats and mice. Infected mice lose their fear of cats. In fact, in one of the studies I think it made them attracted to the smell of cat urine. Right? Which is an interesting effect for it to have in a cat. It makes it easier to get eaten again. The parasites back in the cat's intestinal tract, completes its life cycle, boom, uh, out into the world again. New research by graduate student Wendy Ingram, University of California, Berkeley, res- reveals a scary twist to the scenario. The parasite's effect, it seems, is permanent. Permanent. That's it. You're infected. Permanent effect with you forever. The fearless behavior of mice, which were being studied, persisted long after the mouse recovers from the flu-like symptoms of the toxoplasmosis. And for months after the parasitic infection is cleared from the body, according to the research published uh, this this week. And it's going to be published here in the journal PLOS One, Public Library of Science One online. It, I don't think it's there yet, but it, it'll be there shortly if it isn't. Even when the parasite is cleared and, is, and it's no longer in the brains of the animal, that's the cyst, the little, the little eggy, thing that it's gonna, it's waiting to get back into a cat so it can grow again. Uh, even when it's no longer in the brains of the animals, some kind of permanent long-term behavior change has occurred, even though we don't know what the actual mechanism is, Ingram says, she speculated that the parasite could damage the smell center of the brain, so the odor of the cat urine can't be detected. The parasite could also directly alter neurons involved in memory and learning. Or it could trigger a damaging host response, as in many human autoimmune diseases. Ingram became interested in Toxoplasma gondii, possibly after listening to this show, but I don't know that for <laughs> uh, Oh, yeah, and it's, uh, I left out some of the other symptoms here. There's a good list uh, here. Um, uh, the cysts revive and immune-compromised people. They can lead to death there. Uh, may also be uh, linked to suicidal behavior. Some of the suicidal behavior in the world may be linked to this Toxoplasma gondii, which, again, the only vector for this is cats. They complete their life cycle in cats. Cats is the main vector of this. Another transmission effort is undercooked pork. Uh, so it's, there's other ways that it can get passed around in the, in, in the system, but really cats are the vector. That's where they complete the life cycle. That's what... Uh, that's what determines how much Toxoplasma gondii is going to be in an area, is how many outdoor cats. So pregnant women, of course, are warned to stay away from kitty litter. A lot of people think there's something wrong with kitty litter. That's why pregnant women are supposed to keep away. No, this is why. This is the reason. It's this parasite that comes out of the feces of cats that can get then into the, into the fetus. So let's see. With the help of Michael Eason and Ellen Roby, UC Berkeley professors of molecular In cell biology, Ingram set out three years ago to discover how toxoplasma affects mice's hardwired fear of cats. 
if you tested mice by seeing whether they avoided bobcat urine, which would be normal, versus rabbit urine, which they could probably care less about. Well, earlier studies showed that mice lose their fear of bobcat urine for a few weeks after infection. Ingram showed that the three most common strains of Toxoplasma gondii might make mice less fearful uh, of cats for at least four months, long after the basic infection as time has passed. Using a genetically altered strain of Toxoplasma that is not able to form the cysts and thus unable to cause chronic infections in the brain, she demonstrated that the effect persisted for four months even after the mice completely cleared the microbes from their body. She's now looking at how the mouse immune system attacks the parasite to see whether host response to the infection could be why this is taking place. Yeah, that's the that's one of the big the the big question there right, is right? So, what's actually happening to make it permanent? Are neurons completely damaged by the inflammation in the brain in specific areas or by the cysts? Oh, but this is the thing. Areas. But this is the thing. She used a strain that doesn't form the cysts. Right. So it's it not necessarily the cysts yeah. that does it, right? But there's yeah. there's inflammation that occurs mm -hmm. in the brain as a result of the infection because it is ending up in the brain. So is it the inflammation that is causing damage to neurons or to synapses so that connections are no longer made? Or is it something that's actually a mechanistic change, a systemic change within the neurons themselves? Something that becomes a... Is there um, some kind of um, like retroviral aspect where somehow the parasite puts genes into the mm -hmm. neurons that then, you know, keep getting expressed to turn stuff off. Mm -hmm. You know, so there are a few different different answers to this, but I'm going to expect that there's not a retroviral. I mean, who knows? There could be a retroviral right. aspect. There, this is the, this <laughs> is the most me. controversial aspect of, uh, of what I've read from Ingram here. And it's controversial in a couple of ways because I both agree and completely disagree with what she's about to say here. Uh, and here it is. The idea that this parasite knows more about our brains than we do and has the ability to exert desired change in complicated rodent behavior is absolutely fascinating. Toxoplasma has done a phenomenal job of figuring out mammalian mm -hmm. brains in order to enhance its transmission through a complicated life cycle. So this, the, right? The Wait, anthropomorphism like, of Toxoplasma. Yeah. However... That. However, however, right? I know, like, no, no, that's you can't say it like that. However, right? This is this is one of those life cycles that goes outside, creates things that makes it possible to get back inside its main host, its its vector, right? Its home where it's trying to get back to. What it makes me think of is somehow not that it's doing this complicated task of affecting thought, right, or behavior. But what if at some level the thought that allows us to be attracted, the mouse to be attracted to the cat urine actually isn't very complicated and is something that's been along evolutionarily very long time and something that a microbe has always had access to. A microbe has always had the ability to change uh, mammalian behavior. That this actually isn't a big stretch for them. It's not complicated. Yeah. It's not well thought out. But I mean, it doesn't have to be um, cognitive. However, maybe it's just a natural aspect of being a microbe somehow through some chain of connections, me mechanisms that actually makes the button pushing for something a system as large as a mouse not that difficult. So yeah. what it sounds like to me is that if we can figure out what is affecting the brain in particular? Because that's what we're still not sure about exactly, right? What is specifically attacking these areas of the brain? I think then it becomes very clear how it got there. For mm -hmm. example, if it is inflammation attacking these certain areas where they're settling, then most likely toxoplasmosis or toxoplasma gondii was 
perpetuating its life cycle regardless because m mice get eaten by cats. That just happens, right? Mm -hmm. And then the ones that happen to congregate in parts of the brain where this beneficial thing was happening mm -hmm. propagated Becomes more. And strength, that's called right? evolution. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. So as long as it's something that, that is a simple explanation like wherever they're congregating in the brain is causing inflammation that's causing these behavior changes, it's not a very intentional thing in my mind. It's, yeah, it's not necessarily intentional, but this is definitely, um, you know, this, this feline parasite, this host microbe relationship. So the, the cat, the rat, the parasite, the way this whole life cycle, this relationship works is one that's been developing over hundreds of thousands of years. You know, this is something that is that goes way back. This is something that is not, I mean, it's, it's not going to be just over the last 10, 20 years or something that it's going to have suddenly worked mm -hmm. out this way. I mean, this, these are relationships that um, these mi particular microbes probably um, work very well in particular types of organisms and then you know we're probably looking at you know the the precursors of cats we're looking at the precursors of rats these right. cat and mouse relationships going back ancestrally really far right. and the well, microbes being have, part of it when did we domesticate cats 10,000 years ago right yeah something like that so it, somewhere and, around it, then it probably started happening. Right. It, I mean, it could have been then or it could have been even earlier. This is probably older. Maybe. But, but this is also, older. To, 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 to your point, Blair, too, about the, the evolution of it, just some of these parasites happening to land into the right portion of the brain or affect the brain in a certain way, and that's how it got its desired result. Or how it got the result that desired because it's evolutionarily beneficial just, result. Beneficial, thank you. Beneficial, beneficial result. The beneficial result. It also requires for there have been a lot of the parasite going out there, not getting back in, going to the wrong part of the brain. To, to such an extent that you would think it could pick, it would just be able to move and show up in different parts of the brain or affect different parts of the brain all of the time instead of settling on the only actions that we really need to do is eliminate the sense of smell, maybe even make an attraction towards the thing, <coughs> which is probably the way it happened. I do like the idea, though, that somehow encoded within the Toxoplasma gondii is a series of likes, a series of things it likes from its host, like its cat urine smell is a series of likes. And somehow it's going in, regardless of the host system, and saying, you know what? I'm going to replace your dislike, I mean, your fear of that, with a like. Anything that matches up, I'm going to overwrite it. Sort of like a, if somebody went into your Facebook page and created different likes for you, you'd see all sorts of different ads on the site. Yeah. Changed your interests. I would, I would love to find some. I would love to find somebody going back and trying to do some uh, an an evolutionary analysis of this. Like mm -hmm. going, try and you've got these three strains or multiple strains of toxo. Where did they Where did they originate? When did they first originate? You know, um, at what point did the relationships become the way that they are? And what selective pressures led to this particular system? You know, it's just. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we still don't know a lot about how any of these kinds of systems have evolved. But it's so neat that there is. You know, we have like the lynx snow hair system. You know, kind of simple, but that's one the system that you could look at. Here we have the cat, the rat, and the the toxo system, and just let's let's look at it and see where it came from, going back, and see why certain things were beneficial and why they worked out a particular way. We'll answer a whole bunch of questions. I don't know. Uh, should we take a break and yeah, then come back with break. Blair's Animal Corner? Yeah. Okay. So everyone, we are going to take a short break and we'll be back in just a few moments with more This Week in Science. <laughs> Yeah. 
Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 100,000 books in their library. It's a nice library full of you know, lots of books, like I just said, but they're audiobooks, so you can listen to them and take them anywhere you want with your little mobile device. Or you can listen to them right at your computer. The big thing, you download them and listen to them, which leaves your hands free, your eyes free to do other things. Audible thinks that you might enjoy their service, so why don't you give them a try, right? We've enjoyed their services by uh, downloading science books throughout the years, and you can get one free audiobook download just by trying them out. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash twists. Audiblepodcast.com slash twists. Right now, sign up and get a free audiobook download of your choice and help out twists in the process. We get a little kickback. If you also enjoy helping us out and you want to share your love of twists with the world emblazoned on a hat or a shirt or some other thing that you take with you places, you can do that. Go to twist.org and look in our menu bar for the Zazzle store. Zazzle.com slash This Week in Science is also the link to that store. But twist.org, it's the easiest way to get there. Our Zazzle.com store is full of merchandise that you might be able to purchase or you can purchase and enjoy and share with others. Buy it for somebody else. Show Twist the love and share it. Uh, additionally, we do take donations. We accept any amount that you are able to give, $2 to $2 million. Any amount helps us out because your donations really are what keep this show going. You help keep us in hosting, in our, you know, in everything. Contractors we need to hire to do things to help us get photos for our website, keep our website up to date. You know, there are little things. Your donations help every every step of the way to keep all of this going. So if you want to donate, go to our website, twist.org, and we have PayPal buttons plastered all over the site along the right sidebar and at the bottom of every show page. So go to the most recent show page and listen to the show, re scroll through the show notes, make a few comments, and click on one of those little PayPal donation buttons and donate. We really appreciate your support because we really could not do this without you. And we're back with more This Week in Science, and it is time once again for Blair's Animal Corner with, with Blair. Blair. She works in an aquarium, is a zoologist, is fond of hippos, not so much of pandas and squirrels. Ah! <laughs> I'm a zoologist. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Okay. You are. Uh, let's start with eavesdropping birds, shall we? So, eavesdropping in the wild, or rather, the ability to gather information from other species, could help other animals survive. So, is this kind of like a little bird told me? Yes, exactly That's like that. Yes. <laughs> and eavesdropping, a, f a fancy way of saying eavesdropping is public information parasitism. That's right. So, if you're eavesdropping, you're not eavesdropping, but you are a public information parasite. FYI. Uh, so at uh, the British Ecological Society's Functional Ecology Journal, they recently published a study on scimitar bill and pied babblers in the Kuruman River Reserve. That's right. So <laughs> 18 groups of pied babblers those are not the solitary animals, had, were, so there were these 18 groups, and then 
Within them, around those groups, were 25 scimitar bill breeding pairs. Who, so they weren't groups, they were just little pairs. So they're not cooperative, these two groups. And the scimitar bills don't hang out with each other at all, except for their monogamous pairs. But the babblers are cooperative within their own species, and they have a sentinel system. So one member perches above the group while everyone else is looking for food and looks out for predators. And they will call out when they see a predator approaching that might be dangerous. Hmm. So the scimitar bills... Did you hear the news today, honey? Yeah, yeah. Sounds like we should head to a higher branch. What do you think? Yeah, that's right. So the scimitar bills, they saw significant behavior changes when the pied babblers were around. But the pied babblers didn't change their habits at all when the scimitar bills were there. Essentially, the scimitar bills could focus on foraging and increased biomass intake when they didn't have to look out for predators. They pretty much just mm -hmm. didn't look if they knew that the babblers were around looking for them. And so they could respond to the alarm calls of the babblers. That is clever adaptation. Absolutely clever. Mm -hmm. So that's an amazing adaptation for animals to take advantage of other animals' cooperative social system. I love that. Yeah. Because there's always the question of, okay, there are all these animals in an ecosystem, in a hab habitat. How many of them are really only paying attention to, the, to themselves and their conspecifics, the, you know, the, other, uh, the other individuals in their group? Aren't you going to be paying attention? You're not just paying attention to predators. You're going to be paying attention to Yeah, you've got to be multilinguistical. Yeah, are you helping is something, you know, yeah. How does it all work together? So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's so cool. And it makes perfect sense that if an animal was smart enough to figure out to watch other species' social cues, they could use all of their resources on something else. They don't have to double up, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, now do you want to talk about monogamous fish? <laughs> Let's do it. See okay. the can't. Coelacanths. Coelacanths, we thought, were extinct for a very long time. And in 1938, after they were sure they were extinct, it was published, it was understood. Coelacanths were long gone. They're animals from 300 million years ago. All of a sudden, bam, 1938, they caught one. And, and ever since yummy. then, it <laughs> probably was yummy in 1938. Now you're not supposed to eat them. But they've caught about 300 since 1938. So not a huge amount, but enough for us to know they're around. They're down there. They're definitely yeah. deep-sea animals <clears throat> that are very good at evading humans and fishing poles. So 300 in the past 80 years have been found. Yeah. So they're still trying to figure out a lot of things about coelacanths. And so just recently, they hooked some pregnant ones for the very first time. So, and yes, I did say pregnant. Most fish have, have spawning where the external. females release eggs. Exactly, external fertilization. So the females release eggs and the males release their sperm over the eggs and then they mature on their own, hatch out on their own. That's next, it. Next time I want to find a mermaid with the fish parts on the top. <laughs> Sorry, that's never mind. That's, that's just came out of your mouth. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, that's one of my favorite episodes of Futurama, actually. But so anyway, the coelacanth is one of the few fish species that, you know, discounting sharks and rays because they, a lot of them, are internal fertilizers. But these guys, the coelacanths, are internal fertilizers. They have a pregnancy of about three months, and they can have somewhere, sometimes over 20 embryos in carrying inside of them. We don't know how many of those actually result in live healthy young because we've only ever just caught mm -hmm. pregnant coelacanths. Yeah. But they usually have about 20-something embryos in there. And now what they found is they did microsatellite DNA analysis on these embryos in the females that they caught that were pregnant 
and it looks like they are monogamous. Hmm. How fascinating. Is it? Oh, they're see? big, they're long-lived, they have internal reproduction, and which they're is monogamous. wild, which might, you know... Yeah, that, that, has huge, that has huge implications evolutionarily all by itself, just that right there. However, one is the monogamy thing, though, just to the point of the... the could it be a numbers game? Could it be just there aren't actually, like, pods? This is a good question. And just it happens to be the two nearest each other in a big swath of undersea... Yes. are the only two that hook up because they're the only two they can find. It is possible mm -hmm. that we fished them almost to extinction, thought they were extinct. In fact, there are so few now that they don't have so much choice. That is definitely possible. It's also possible because they're deep-sea creatures, they're enormous, they don't live in large groups, that they just can't find anybody else. They don't want to put the energy, and that's what this... Uh, article is suggesting is that they don't want to put so much energy into looking for multiple males. In general, if you were a fish, you were a female fish, you might want to try to find more males so that you could have things like sperm competition and so you could hedge your bets. Essentially, you can have a bunch of babies with a bunch of different genetic packages carrying your DNA one of those is bound to do well, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it looks like, yeah, they're monogamous, at least within a mating season, and they will only mate with one male. Uh, that was what I was going to ask, whether or not it was similar to monogamy in birds, where you can't really tell versus uh, mating season versus life monogamy. I would say you are pretty hard-pressed to find an animal that is truly monogamous for the lifetime. Even animals that you consider to be lifetime monogamous species like penguins, Human? like stuff like that, humans, <laughs> there are often switch-ups. Often. Mm -hmm. And that's because in this game of life, we're just trying to perpetuate DNA. And if you suddenly find a better mate to your DNA package that you have, why would you not just jump ship and try to get that better DNA? We <laughs> have our own reasons, but in terms of the mating game out in the wild animal world, those reasons don't really apply. Uh, Light in the chat room has an interesting question. I don't think we have the answer to necessarily. What stage of development do they give birth at? I mean, what stage of development? Are the little um, they're, they're ready to go. Wow. So ovoviviparous <laughs> animals like fish and types of fish, sharks, right? The reason that they will have ovovivipary, which means they have an egg inside their body, the egg passes through the birth canal, and as it's going through the birth canal, it the egg reabsorbs so that you essentially give birth to a ready-to-go, a precocial young. The reason for that is... It varies, but most of the time it's just because the outside world is too harsh for a teeny tiny version of them or an egg. And so that's the, that's the whole point, is that you're, you're giving birth to precocial young, meaning they are off on their own, they're ready to go. I've, I've often found my own young to be somewhat precocious. No, <laughs> our young is altricial because totally they can't altricial. walk or eat or take care of themselves for at least a year, right? Even if you oh, had yeah. oh, crazy precocial children, Sometimes you'd have to keep them for at least 30. two or three years before they could. there's any way they could make it out in the real world. Sometimes, sometimes yeah. they could be more over 20 years old and still be living at home. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> possible. <laughs> Yes, so anyway, um, additionally, the, they found that the coelacanths had amazing genetic variation with their mates, meaning either their relatives were nowhere near them or they intentionally were picking animals that were not in any way related, hmm. which is cool. And the pregnancy, in case you were wondering, I said it was a three-month pregnancy. I misspoke. It's three years. Oh, I totally said the wrong word. Oh my goodness! Wait a second. 
Yeah. Wait a second. So, so somebody asked about whether or not the uh, the monogamy would have something to do with uh, the lighter. care of the young, the precociousness. So, if they are ready to go precocious, they're not going to be being cared for by no. the adults once they are born. They are often running. So, monogamy does not have to do with parental care here. But three years, you you have a three year old fish that you're birthing. Mm -hmm. Oh, mama. Hmm. Yep. Wow. Yep. And if you think about again sharks a lot of sharks have been around for 400 million years so they're even older than the coelacanth they also have a really long pregnancy about two or three years some sharks and they also have live birth and give birth to precocial young so then you wonder which came first because a lot of these more recent fish species that have not been around for very long have the external fertilization but you would assume the internal fertilization actually is more advanced yeah. but it's because, difficult to say because because you can give more care and your energy is better channeled into fewer young as opposed to having 500 eggs and then 400 of them are eaten that's a waste of energy um, you can also make sure that your DNA packet is ready to go and you can watch after it a little bit better. But this is all speculation. We don't know exactly where what happened <laughs> in the evolutionary scale. But anyway, coelacanths, monogamous, interesting stuff. <laughs> totally. Yeah. There, there's a whole, I mean, it's just there's a whole bunch of interesting interesting details that come into this conversation. And know. questions that follow it up. Does that mean that the, the, if you're monogamous to a coelacanth that you're only going to have sex once every three years at the most? That Probably. female, yes. But this is, this is the thing. And then Them being monogamous, again, does not mean that whoever you mate with, they stick around with you for the next three years. That's not exactly how we talk about monogamy in animals. Sometimes yeah. they stick around, but with the coelacanth, that just means you come together for a mating event mm -hmm. and you don't look for other mating events until you've had your babies. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean after those three years you'd go back to the same gentleman or even that he would still be in the same area or that he would have waited for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just means the females don't go looking for multiple mates within right. a breeding right. cycle. Right, because the uh, whoever the male coelacanth, the, the uh, unknown, uh, unknown father is in this case, he could actually have many, many, many other pregnant coelacanths uh, yes. bearing his offspring in the same... Yeah, so you can kind of think, yeah. it, think about it like a big love situation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It could be a, a, a polygamous coelacanth. Yeah. Like, we don't know. But as far as we know. But she's monogamous is the point. The she, females are monogamous. This we know. Yeah, well, for at least for three years. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a tough one. This is a, this is difficult to read well, into. Well, that's what I'm saying is, yeah. the, is the monogamy in animals is not how we define it in humans. No. No. And no, how we define not. it in humans is often... For example, <laughs> it's right. very, very confusing. Uh, any more stories for the animal corner? No, I, I have one story about plants. If there's time, but you do something instead. Go. Animals eat plants. Um, <laughs> so my story that I wanted to talk about: uh, life in the upper atmosphere. A what? Uh, researchers. Publishing in a kind of questionable journal. It has a nice sounding name, Journal of Cosmology, but it's um, not necessarily the, uh, it doesn't look the most reputable. So if you look at the, uh, the, the website for this, uh, this journal, I don't know, could be fine, could be not, we don't know. There's, uh, there are questions that people have asked about this study and this journal. But, uh, Journal of Cosmology, it's peer-reviewed, so people have reviewed this. Researchers from the University of uh, Sheffield, I believe, uh, British researchers, have recovered diatoms, or 
bits of diatoms, not if not full ones, which are a type of algae, single-celled, but they have these wonderful uh, kind of crystalline structures to them. And they have DNA. So, uh, scientists set, these scientists set up a balloon to the stratosphere, 16 miles up, and they found diatoms, came back with diatoms. Mm -hmm. And they did it during a recent meteor shower. So, they say that they have 95% uh, significance to believe that these diatoms came from somewhere else. What? Yeah, they they say, quote, we're very, very confident these are biological entities originating from space because they say, how the heck would they have gotten up there anyway? To which I, of course, think would respond, well, there are all Wait, sorts of yeah. upwellings and updrafts, and we know that there are bacteria. We know bacteria and microbes that float around in, in clouds and such. Yeah. Right, but are they as high as the stratosphere is the question here. So um, I would say yes, that there is probably mixing all the way even out to the stratosphere, but there is the chance that it uh, there is life that seeds our outer atmosphere, our upper atmosphere, when meteors hit our atmosphere and begin to burn up and they drop bits of themselves. There's dust and pulverizations that that are left in the upper atmosphere. So it's very possible that there could be something originating from elsewhere, finding itself so that we could find it in the upper atmosphere. But, I don't know. I think it's very questionable. But add to that a uh, study that was also recently published in a much more prestigious journal, Nature Geoscience, this week. Uh, researchers um, replicated the impact shock of, say, a meteor colliding with our atmosphere. Uh, they used a special specialized gun, a special gun to shoot high velocity steel projectiles into icy mixtures with chemical compositions similar to comets. Hmm. Um, they, uh, what it says in this uh, this report, that so they threw them, they shot them out at seven kilometers per second, and they triggered shock waves that caused amino acids to form from the mixture's basic chemical compounds. And they wow. synthesized eight amino acids this way, including glycine and alanine, which are very important, um, important, important. important for proteins. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> importines, yes. Uh, Time Magazine said, water plus heat can equal biology. Hmm. Which, in a sense... Is true. You do need a little bit of uh, some thermal reaction in there. Um, the researchers are quoted as saying, our work shows that the basic building blocks of life can be assembled anywhere in the solar system and perhaps beyond. However, the catch is that these building blocks need the right conditions in order for life to flourish. So they've demonstrated it's a, you know, this isn't the, the um, primordial soup experiment, but this is I think this is a really great experiment to show that uh, these basic molecules could be forming just about anywhere that you have the right chemicals and the right conditions in space and time. So maybe the diatoms formed in the stratosphere. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think that, that it's much more likely that our planet is exuding life. Yeah. Then, then is really acquiring it from a destination that perhaps was never in a situation in which life could form. Yeah, I mean, I love the idea of panspermia. Awesome. You know? yeah. Love to think that there is constantly stuff hopping from one place to another yeah. throughout our universe, but um, you know, we just have so much life here. And yeah. now it's yeah much more likely that it's kind of kind of the way that um, when you rub your arm you don't even really realize it but there's skin cells and mites and all sorts yeah. of things falling all over the place. Might be traveling all throughout the, the solar system. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. If I if I might lend a metaphor though, if you think about it, so they have think about sea monkeys, right? Sea monkeys or brine. I love shrimp. to think about sea monkeys. They come in these little cysts or these little eggs, and they have to be hatched out with the exact right temperature, time in water, chemicals, and food. Yeah, it has to be all the exact right stuff. And if any of it is slightly off, don't they don't hatch into anything. I don't. But if I you can't. Do it, yeah, go ahead. If you do it just right, you get sea monkeys. You get little brine shrimp. So it almost makes sense that there'd be these little things like sea monkey eggs just landing all over and 9.9999999% of the places where it lands, the eggs don't hatch. But in one of those places where the eggs go, it's going to be just right and it could turn into an entire colony of brine shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> It's just right for an entire colony. Uh, so we have uh, we have jumped over our hour. Yeah, I've got I got I got to uh, bust let's out a quick story. Okay. I got to do my unplugged story. My do my please resuscitate. Do not unresuscitate or do not take me off of the life support systems at any point. Okay. Researchers, this is a uh, University of Montreal. It's from Canada, but we're gonna call it legitimate anyway. Researchers observed never before detected brain activity, active brain state beyond the deep coma associated with a flat EEG. Researchers from the University of Montreal and their colleagues have found brain activity beyond a flat-lined EEG, which they have called new complexes. Uh, according to existing scientific data, researchers and doctors had established that beyond the so-called flat line, there is nothing at all. No brain activity, no possibility of cognitive life taking place. This discovery suggests that there's a whole new frontier in animal and human brain functioning. New frontier! Researchers observed human patient in extreme deep hypoxic coma under powerful anti-epileptic medication that he had been required to take due to his health issues. Dr. Bod uh, Bogdan Floria of Romania contacted our research team because he had observed unexplainable phenomenon on the EEG of a coma patient. We realized that there was cerebral activity unknown until now in the patient's brain, says Dr. Florin Amzica, director of the study and professor of the University of Montreal School of Dentistry. Dr. Amzica's Am team then decided to recreate the patient's state in cats standard animal model for some neurological studies. Using the anesthetic isoflurane, mm -hmm. they placed the cats in an extremely deep but completely reversible coma. Cats passed the flat EEG line, which is associated with the silence of the cortex, governing portion of the brain. The team observed cerebral activity in 100% of the cats in deep coma in the form of oscillations generated in the hippocampus part of the brain responsible for memory and learning processes. These oscillations, unknown until now, were transmitted to the master part of the brain, the cortex. The researchers concluded that the observed EEG waves or new complexes were the same as those observed in the human patient. Hmm. Yeah, the doctor then uh, stresses the importance of understanding the implications of these findings. Those who have decided to have uh, or to ha have decided to or have to unplug a near brain dead relative needn't worry or doubt their doctor. The current criteria for diagnosing brain death are extremely stringent. Our finding may perhaps in the long term lead to a redefinition of this cr criteria, but we are very far away from that. Moreover, this is not the most important or useful aspect of our study. <laughs> the most useful aspect of this finding is the therapeutic potential the neuroprotection of extreme deep coma. After a major injury, some patients are in such serious condition that doctors deliberately place them in an artificial coma to protect their body and brain so they can recover. But Dr. Amzica believes that the extreme deep coma experimented on the cats may be a more protective comatose state to put people in. Put people in. Hmm. Indeed. Indeed, an organ or muscle that remains inactive for a long time eventually atrophies. 
It is plausible that the same applies to the brain kept for an extended period in the state corresponding to a flat EEG. An inactive brain coming out of prolonged coma may be in worse shape than a brain that has had minimal activity going on during that time. Research on the effects of extreme deep coma during the hip, which the hippocampus is active through this new complexes is absolutely vital for the benefit of future patients. Another implication of this finding is that we now have evidence that the brain is able to survive an extremely deep coma if the integrity of the nervous structures are preserved. Uh, we also found that the hippocampus can send orders to the brain's commander-in-chief cortex. Finally, the possibility of studying and learning and memory process of the hippocampus during a state of coma will help further understanding of them. In short, all sorts of avenues of basic research are opening up to us. Hmm. I think it's I think it's fascinating, uh, you know, because there there there's a question as to why some people wake up and why other people don't. Mm -hmm. You know, so there is obviously a lot we don't understand about the differences in brains, and you know, we have these general categories of brain waves: a brain that's active has these beta waves, a brain or theta waves, a wave a brain that's um, relaxed is uh, at 60 hertz alpha waves. You know, there are all these you know different categories that you can say this is what it looks like on an EEG. But for um, you know a specific brain, somebody, an individual is going to have a very specific kind of electrical activity that's going to slightly differ from the norm, right? And so maybe there are some individuals who have slightly different electrical setups. Or slightly slight something that's slightly different in the way that their brain communicates, so that they do have something like this new complex that they've discovered that they are mm -hmm. uh, looking into more deeply. Maybe everybody has it, but if everybody had it, I would question why they hadn't seen it already. I, I, I yeah, and so the the entire reason uh, for reporting on this study tonight for me was so that. Anybody who has their hand on the plug understands I'm still, I got my thinking and learning centers rocking and rolling in there. I'm just on standby. It's like sleep mode. There's still, the memories are there. Everything is there ready to rock and roll. Do not pull the plug. And if it is some sort of psychedelic dream state, I'm probably cool with it. <laughs> Good to know. Cool with it. I'll stick with that psychedelic dream state. Everyone, don't pull the plug on Justin. Don't pull the plug on us uh, because there's always more science to talk about. Um, um, Blair had a plant story. I have one final story about telomeres. I posted on it earlier this week on uh, Facebook and Twitter um, and Google+. Plus. But there's a pilot study that's been published in the Lancet Oncology suggesting that a healthy lifestyle, uh, one of the authors of this study is Dean Ornish, by the way, who's well, who's well known for um, promoting a particular uh, dietary lifestyle, um, and a researcher here at uh, UCSF. But they have this pilot study suggests that if you are healthy, and change your lifestyle, good eating habits, sleeping, meditation, all that kind of stuff, then you can actually lengthen your telomeres. Telomeres yes. being the parts of the chromosome, the caps on the ends of the chromosomes, which are supposed to be related to aging. So that as you age, telomeres get shorter, shorter they are, closer you are to death. So if you could lengthen them, that's awesome. This is a pilot study. I will reiterate, it's a very small group of individuals. So the conclusions that we can draw from this study, however much we want to draw from this study and how exciting it is, are very slim, very small. They need to do more work. Yeah. That being it's said, I need to sleep more. And what else? Yes. Eat better? Sleep more, eat better, uh, meditate, yeah, exercise. Yeah. Yeah, and use my brain. Things. Right. And use so, your brain. Okay. But again, yeah. still, but again, Blair, still a long way from having it in pill form, which we're <laughs> really, really waiting for. So that nobody has to do any of these good things, nah, right? I don't know. All if that they stuff got it in pill good form, to me. <laughs> being healthy is pretty awesome. There's also, um, if you have 
are not into the Scientist magazine, the uh, dash scientist dot com. They have an article in this in this month's issue that is a little lengthy to read, but really interesting um, about eating and our circadian clock. It's called Out of Sync, subtitle, Why Eating at the Wrong Times is Tied to Such Profound and Negative Effects on Our Bodies. goes into a lot of molecular uh, reasons related to circadian rhythms that, um, that diet and lifestyle go hand in hand. So that's right along with that. That was in that um, brain trust book that you gave me too, was that they claimed you could eat pretty much anything you wanted, but as long as it was all breakfast to dinner was within an eight-hour window, mm -hmm. you would stay fit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's some interesting, cool. interesting stuff out there to, if you really want to live by the clock and standardize your life, yeah, you could live a, li live a bit longer, live a bit healthier. And Blair, what was your plant story? Uh, grope your plants, everyone. What? <laughs> <laughs> Rub your plants, for real. <laughs> Gently rubbing the leaves of plants. Uh, this was Thale Crest plants. Between the thumb and forefinger activates an innate defense mechanism that helps keep them healthy. Within minutes, biochemical changes can occur, causing the plant to become more resistant to funguses that cause gray mold. So rubbing them as a form of mechanical stress which makes them, as they are dealing with mechanical stress, it helps them to actually protect themselves from real danger. The, if you think about that in the wild, it's stuff like wind, rain, animals walking on the plants, all of these things help keep them healthy because it keeps them alert. But when you take a plant into your house or into a greenhouse, there are less of those stresses and it they 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 kind of get caught off guard when things come that can hurt them. So touch is important, and this is kind of goes back to when you talk about taking care of animals in captivity. I always have to bring it back to the animals, right? Enrichment is stuff that you do to keep the animal doing natural behaviors, keep them interested and engaged in their surroundings, even though they're in uh, captivity. And we often say in the animal world. Not all enrichment is positive. So no. we're not saying yeah. to torture the animals or bother them or stress them out, but occasional stress is actually good for an animal's health. And so you're seeing this also in the plants. Occasional stress helps them keep all of their defenses up and helps to keep them healthy. Nice. I can see it now, the headline... Davis man arrested for fondling plants. <laughs> but I swear it was for the good of the plants. Yes, wound and rub your plants. Even cutting off parts of the leaves can help keep them healthy because they're keeping their... Um, well, explains why pruning. Is yeah, good. pruning, Pru exactly. Pruning. They're keeping Spending all of their time oxygen time. species mm -hmm. up. They're... They're regenerating new tissue. They're regenerating new tissue. They're regenerating the missing tissue, right? So wound and rub your plants, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> this is just getting better and yeah, better. I love true. these one-liners from Blair. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you get. I'm sorry. This is, this is what we get. All right, everyone. Uh, Justin, did you have one more story, or are we good? Uh, they put some uh, dinosaurs uh, in a wind tunnel. There's uh, the secret dinosaurs. underlife uh, microbes. This is actually more interesting, though. The plant microbes are ruling the world. Uh, so yeah. we got to be careful not to kill microbes that are responsible for plants being able to grow, because whether we're cutting them or cuddling them... Um, Microbes play a significant role in the health of plants. Abs. Breaking science news. Uh, hey, everybody, thank you for enjoying the show. Do we have any shout-outs? Do we need a shout-out or anything? Yeah, I would love to give a shout-out to Arn Lore Siphon for, once again, for helping with the twist.org slash live uh, 
website, getting that site up so that people can enjoy the show right from our our homepage and not have to try and deal with all the, where's the link? How do you find it? Where on YouTube, huh? Mm -hmm. Twist.org slash live. So easy. Thank you guys for making that happen. Totally awesome. And totally we have a awesome. promo. We have a promo and, of that. Do we have the promo? And we have a promo now. Ah, we do. <laughs> that you can like and link and share and uh, get other people interested in checking out This Week in it Science. Is, it is and it, isn't it called, it's called What is Twist, right? Isn't that what it's called? This is Twist. This is Twist. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> it's called This is Twist. Maybe I'll be able to find it. I don't know. I, I had an issue with with videos last night, last week, so I don't know if it's worth it. We, we might do it after the show. Okay, great. I'll play it. I will find it. But uh, other thank yous, I wanted to say thank you as well to Ulysses for heading over to the Lady Mission and keeping us all up to date among the Twist Minion world about what was going on with them because we haven't been reporting on it because I'm waiting to actually hear some data back from it before we actually start reporting on it. And I wasn't reporting on it because I thought the lady mission was something completely different. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies? But, um, yeah. All right. I think we will be back. Watching. Yeah, next week. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is available via podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have an Android device, you can look for Twist for Droid app in the Android Marketplace. Or you can just go to your Google Plus or go to twist, uh, go to twist.org, www.twist.org backslash live. Uh, just a, it's just a slash, guys. It's just a slash. Slash. Is it just, just a slash? slash. What's the difference? I don't know my slash from my backslash. No. It's a forward slash. It's a forward slash. <laughs> or slash live every Thursday around this time to watch it live. Yes. Um, for more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website, twist.org. We also want to hear from you, so email us at kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, justin at thisweekinscience.com, or Blair Baz at twist.org. Be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line, or your email will be spam filtered into oblivion. Oh, yeah, you can also contact us on the Twitter, though, if you don't like putting twists in the subject line. You can contact us on the Twitter, at Dr. Kiki, at Jacksonfly, or at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, please let us know. And we'll be back here next week. We hope you'll join us again for some more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. Science is the end of the world, so I'm setting up a shop. Got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in. I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand, and all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. Science, science, science. science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. Science, science, science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just better understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. 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 And this week in science is coming your way. So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Got the eye Cause it's this week in science This week 
in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 Laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way you better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. This week in science, 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 this week in science. Where'd you go, Blair? Where'd you go? My my contact lens is not uh, working well. See. I think I need to put on my glasses. Put on your glasses. Yeah. Nice. Well done. Well done, everyone. And we have done a show, and we have completed it before 9.30, and I think it will not be terribly difficult for me to edit it. Yay! All right. When are we? Uh, when are we, we are going back on the uh, on the radio radio show? So this the, uh, quarter. Wow, that's yeah. soon. That's soon. <laughs> it's like now. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. This we're going to be on KDBS again. We were off for a little while. We'll be back on KDBS at Davis, UC Davis, on Tuesday mornings, eight thirty to nine thirty. The old time AM. slot. Oh, it's we even got our time slot back. We I got our it. time slot. Why are we have a pirate? <laughs> Devil Blair. <laughs> I hit randomize. It was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> um, are we... Is, is tomorrow talk like a pirate day? It was today. It was today. today. Oh, how did I miss that? My, uh, Arr. my uh, daughter's school has the, the most awesome crossing guard ever. Um, she goes all out. She's normally got a hat that looks like a, like a pylon. <laughs> <laughs> with this stop sign, and she's this awesome lady. But she was she was a full on pirate today, pirate regalia, oh, dressed like oh, a pirate. That's and, awesome. Job for cars. <laughs> 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 that's awesome. It's uh, I Some spoke to one of my coworkers today, and uh, I asked her. I said, "Good morning." She goes. Ahoy! And I said, what? How are you doing today? And she went, Arr! And it took about four before I was like, <laughs> It's talk like a pirate day, what isn't are you it? What doing? <laughs> My problem is I don't see enough people. Maybe. Huh? Science of what? I'm trying to find things. Sign in? No, screw you, YouTube. What? <laughs> oh, if I move my, my mouth, it moves the hat. What? No, no, no. No, you're doing, you're really great. You're really fantastic. <laughs> this I mean this. This is software. Really, it's really interesting. For me to poop on. For <laughs> me. Right. Okay, so I was trying to make YouTube very easy, but um, YouTube, you are annoying me. Is it now? Is it a way, is there a way to get it out of the? Because it's in the Google Plus, right? YouTube. I switched it to the yeah to be linked to the Google Plus thing. Does that make it a different website? Is it YouTube.com/slash This Week in Science? I don't know. Space parentheses twists uh, end parentheses. You know better than I. I mean ellip parentheses ellipses with the dots. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, yeah, I don't know. Somebody needs to help me because I just want it to be slash this week in science. I, and I don't want to change the Google Plus page. And oh my God, Google, you are so annoying. I don't understand. It's really. Well, yeah, I don't understand crap, either. I, I don't know, understand. I and, so uh, much right now about Google and this stuff. I need somebody to do can I, can I tell you so something tired I do like, of this. Can I tell you something I do like? No matter what computer I go to, if I if I in the Google Plus type in this, we're one of the top. Can I show um, you something else too? I'm gonna screen share. So on fizz.org when I was looking at my stories. Fizz. Look what's on either side of the story. Do you see? <laughs> That how did that get wait, there? That's wait, not even a good on. poster. <laughs> Doctor Kiki, mad scientist poster on. No, Zeta. I get. By the way, that I've seen that too. I've seen That's that. That's not too. even I'm a good like, poster. How does it get there? It's yeah, I don't know, but that poster. I did not put that there. No, no, no. But that poster apparently, apparently the. Uh, it's the really swag, low resolution. The swag site. Must must have gotten more hits on that than anything else, and they're now Honey. probably advertising it for you. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. funny. Yeah, that needs to change. <laughs> it's, it's already out there. I need to get rid of that. I forget how to log into Sazzle. This is gonna. Be mm -hmm. No, no, we like we. I like the. It's a good poster. I've got two of them now. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. This is This Week in Science. So there's a share button, but that's just going to share the post within Google+. Plus. I'm trying to see other products by This Week in Science. How do I go to our Zazzle store from here? Go to twist.org and click on It's zazzle.com slash This Week in Science, I think. So zazzle.com. <laughs> oh, it yeah. comes in a bunch of different types of mugs. I didn't even realize. You can you know, get it on a beer stein. We're closing in on 200,000 pluses to our This Week in Science site. Wow, really? Yeah. Ooh, I want this travel mug. That's amazing. I like the travel mug. Tra we have a travel mug? Yeah, look. Here. <laughs> it looks really good. Somebody else must have. Arn Laura, did you do that? I don't think that I've. I, I think I it just not comes. Do that. No, once they a bunch have of, when you once start. you have a mug, it oh. lets you pick all these different mugs. Mm. Look at that. Oh, that look, it looks that sexy. That is freaking it. awesome, man. I want it. Yeah. Twist travel mug. Mm -hmm. That would be kind of neat. I should get one of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I walk around with a travel mug at work all day. Kind of expensive for a I know. Trouble. I know. Don't we get a discount? Hmm. <laughs> 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 Jeez. Mm. You know what we should do is we should just make bumper stickers and then we can turn anything we want into twist merchandise. <laughs> we should make bumper stickers, though. I kind of think that's a good idea. Oh, like we have, used to have them. I, you I, could have that on a bumper sticker. You could have, like... Our faces with no, um, but, some weird statement. No, no, I'm saving. I, I think we should do one of those headshot the photo professional photo shoot ones that we did. Awesome. We should do a billboard. A billboard? Yeah, where's the money for that? Huh? A billboard? Yeah, a billboard. Who's paying for that? We'll just find like an empty one and like do it <laughs> all gorilla go style. go in the middle of the night. Or erect one on our own property. All right. On Science Island. Did something did something happen over on YouTube? You guys, people in the chat room are talking about some com comments in the YouTube site. Uh oh. No. Uh -oh. I went over there and I'm not seeing anything really bad, but I'm guessing you somebody already. Oh, oh, there. Wait. Is it on our main page? Oh. Oh. There we go. I will. Where is it? Roy's it? on our it YouTube. Say? Boo this like all off y'all. If I were a hip hop singer, that's what it would have sounded like. <laughs> if I were a rapper. Um I'm gonna Is the main it was just discussion on the main page? Fuck. I don't see anything. 
Okay. Okay. And then I'm also going to re... It doesn't just... I have to remove it. There we go. That's gone. And then we're going to... We're going to remove you. And then... There but we go. I didn't get to see that... The comment wasn't that interesting. Oh, is it this one from a year ago? There are some from a year ago that are not great, but uh, tonight's, I guess. I don't know. Oh, I didn't see anything yeah. about tonight. No, there's this one that... <laughs> can I tell you what it says? Maybe. Maybe. You have to it leave says, off the bad words. No, there's no bad words. It just says, Dr. Kiki, we slept in a bed two weeks ago. Please answer my calls. <laughs> what? <laughs> you might want to remove that one. Where is that one? That's on the main page. So if you go to youtube.com slash this week in science oh and then God. click on discussion. Mm -hmm. It's a few down, it says one year ago. <laughs> discussion. One year ago somebody put this up? Yeah, the the Where picture is, is just like room? a square of pink. <laughs> Do you see it? Yeah. <laughs> That's really funny. That's so um, weird. Um uh, yeah, let's just... Please answer my calls. <laughs> uh, Why were you answering their calls, Kiki? I, what? Yeah, you know, it was just a one-night stand, you know. Oh, my gosh. What? No. What? Wait, wait, what's this one? What's this one? What? I love science. I like Dr. Kiki. But Justin <laughs> is more than annoying. His childish attempts at humor and being cute are a hindrance to the program. He rarely adds anything of value to the conversations. In fact, this is from two years ago. From discussions yeah. off topic in irrelevant directions with no clear point. Sadly, he often seems amused at himself for doing this. I would hope that his comments improve in content. Otherwise, I hope his presence greatly is reduced or completely illuminated from the program. <laughs> I like illuminated. I like I would the like idea to, that I would, I would like to see your presence completely illuminated. Just start glowing more and more. <laughs> <laughs> until, until illum illuminated. illuminated. Oh, I'm well, being illuminated know, on the program. Ah. There are some not so great comments about me on the uh, on the website, Wait, so it's fine. Wait, what's somebody saying stuff about you on the, on the oh, website? Oh, somebody said that I was I was childish in my discussion about was... things that I talk about. Yeah. No, that was a while ago. They were silly. I know. It's like so... the fact that they thought it was childish just meant that they were being childish because I wasn't. <laughs> I was talking about it. Yeah. Gord, I did get the email. I just got a chance to glance at it. Uh, it looks awesome. So I have to figure out. Um, I'll, I will get you blogger access to the website. How does that sound? Because I could put it up myself. But if you're willing to do it, it would be much easier. I'll just give you, I'll send you, send you the details. The details would be great. Because then when we have other things and then, you know, basically the minions will run the asylum. Very which soon. is at, which with with this asylum which is, is yeah which this asylum is fine now we have a good asylum we should let our lunatics run it what verbals wait why didn't why we didn't reply to some posts I don't know what posts are doing. I never look at comments I didn't even know there were comments on our website I'm like oh look people made comments that's that's cool. Except for when it's not cool. <laughs> Except for when it's not cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have a lot of views. That's nice. Do we? I can't see them on mine. I don't have my. I don't have a viewfinder. A viewfinder. <laughs> because I'm coming from the uh, back end. You're all the site owner. Yeah. So, performance. In the last 30 days, we have had 18,564 views. In the last on how YouTube. long? On YouTube. In the last for how the, long? For the whole channel? Or, the I'm last, sorry. 
Yeah, for the whole channel. Uh huh. In the last thirty days, we've had eighteen thousand five hundred six, eighteen thousand five hundred sixty-four views. So not quite keeping up with the uh, iTunes numbers, but uh, you know, that's pretty good. Those are legit. And you know uh, what? And you know what? We hmm. made eighteen dollars off of that. <laughs> Seriously? We make money from this? From getting watched? Yeah. Just getting views. The reruns. YouTube yeah. makes money. You a little bit. We got eighteen dollars. <laughs> I didn't know you made money from YouTube. Very little. So, and well, so we you have, have to get, get a lot more people movie. watching us. We have to go movie. viral or something. Yeah, yeah right. we have to go viral. viral. Mm -hmm. Um. So next week. Do you know what the, do you know what the iTunes numbers are? Uh, not offhand. I could find them. Take mm. me a few minutes. Mm. But I'm very curious because I had no idea what they were. I don't have a clue. <laughs> Next week, we're going to start the show with a funny video of me getting hit in the nuts. Um, <laughs> Kiki's cat uh, doing something ridiculous. Yes, that'll so and do we and babies we have we yeah. have yeah. Oh, I've got oh I've got a cute baby. I should do a cute baby. We'll just make just do an entire show that's just all a one virally thing after another until. <laughs> Yeah. Eventually about, we get twenty dollars. How about we? What about my child, who's kind of still a little bigger than a baby, toddler screaming at a cat? That's good. Get that on, I could get that on video for you guys. Yeah, Mark, yeah, we can now afford definitely. a cup of coffee, but can we afford to put it in one of our own mugs? <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, Our it's Lord actually not bad, seeing as how the show was started with a budget of less than $18. Identity 4, awesome. If you would help me pick a mixer, that would be great. That would be so fantastic. Uh, yeah, Hot Rod, I bet YouTube has made quite a bit more than the $18 that we have gotten from it. They probably made 20 <laughs> They have to pay their shareholders, you know, whatever. That's right, whatever. Meh. Yeah, we can't, <laughs> from our views this last month, we, we can't, can't even, even buy one of our own travel no! books. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. We can't it. get the travel mug, but we might be able to afford at least the coffee mug that we could then save up for a couple of months down the road and get the coffee Let's player. look. The cheapest possible mug... Is twenty dollars. <laughs> yeah, twenty is the cheapest one. Yeah. All right. Next week, we should be there. Next week, we should have been able to afford a coffee mug. Next week, join us. The week after, yes. actual coffee in the mug. <laughs> yeah. No, I really want one of these. I had a. I used to have a twist mug. I don't know what happened to it. I had all kinds of stuff. I had a twist mug. I had a twist hat. I had twist shirts. I was all merchandised out. You were. I was. I don't know what happened to my hat. I stopped wearing it. Oh, because I replaced it with Marshall's uh, vintage porn trucker hat. That oh, was that was, was my awesome. awesome, most awesomest hat ever. It was. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. I still, we still have some of those, those hats. Those are, those are awesome collector's items. I've got mine stored mm -hmm. away in a, uh, in a bank vault. And I got in one of those, what do you call it? The pod, the safety deposit boxes. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we also have, um, we have a hat press. So, and some blank hats. So, come up with something that we want to. Mm, I like that. I know a lot, but we can make a, a limited run. Maybe I'll sketch some stuff for Twist. I haven't drawn in months. Hmm. Hmm. Iron Lore says, if you go to Feed Burner, you should be able to get the stats. I still have... I, I know I got to Feed Burner once in the last few months. I could figure that out. Oh, Gold Zader, you're in your second mug. I'm sorry the first one broke, but thank you for buying a second one. That's awesome. He probably broke it. He was mad about <laughs> it. That's right. <laughs> Oops, gotta buy a new one. Hmm. Twist.org slash YouTube. Ooh, going. What's that? 
What does that do? What does that do? I'm going to go there right now. What's there? Oh, it goes to the YouTube page. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So, mm, nice. So you can just, uh, maybe I'll just start tweeting every few days, like, watch the latest twists at twist.org slash YouTube. And look, yes. look, look, there's, uh, there's the, uh, the new uh, promo. The commercial. Mm -hmm. Right up front. Nice. Yeah, so I'm, okay, I'm going to try and do, supposedly I should be able to show YouTube videos, right? Uh-huh. That's what people say. And I've got a video right here, but there's this stupid menu bar in the way. And if I press play, I won't be able to talk anymore. Tell me if you see this. It's Because I'm watching it, but how do I share it? Screen share? Oh, I should, it shouldn't be screen share. It should just play it. Why is it broken for me? Do you see YouTube in your apps on the left? Mm. Oh, and if you uh, share that one, it's got the right thumbnail. Yeah. This app would like to... Accept. Welcome to YouTube and Hangouts. Everyone sees the same video and playlist, so adding and skipping videos will affect everyone. Only you see your search queries. Okay, create playlist. There's the play unit. Oh! <laughs> Um, do you see anything? No. No, I don't, I don't see anything. But you know what? I don't see anything, but you know what? You know what is making me read? Page. What? It yeah. did. It's like, to be able to use this, you need to create a YouTube page. Google. They're competitors or something? They don't, uh, they don't, they don't play nice. Why do uh, I keep getting muted now? <laughs> and then just I'm goes away. confused. I didn't go. I'm, am I? Did I go away? <laughs> Sharks, like... space, and sexuality. <laughs> and then I looked at the oh, side. Oh yeah, Goldizator, you're probably right. What? Uh, he said he doesn't think it's meant for Hangouts on Air. Mm. Can anybody out there hear the audio from the YouTube? Am I still muted? No, uh -uh. I can hear you. I can't hear the thing. Where did it go? Stop. I don't want to hear I love the music. That's... <laughs> Just... Grr, the music I found. <laughs> So there's two versions of this, by the way. What? I've seen two versions of this. What do you mean? Uh, there's, did one. there's one where the names are up there, like, and there's one where they aren't. Names? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Names of what? Us, the Us. people who are the hostesses. The hostesses. I yeah, didn't I... see names. So you didn't see names. The one on the YouTube now that that links to has the names. The first one I saw had the names, and then I, I was looking I up added later them and had no names. As, I added them as tags within, as um, whatever they're called, within YouTube. So it's not something I put in in the edit on my end, but it's within YouTube. So. Oh, interesting. I got you. I see. Oh, I, you can okay. click it off. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so... Knowing that people are not hearing the YouTube and not seeing the YouTube, that will not let me upload the music for Twist to YouTube to be able to play it during the show. So that seamless solution will not work. I believe I am still needing a mixer. Yes. Yeah, I need something. So basically I need the laptop to go into a mixer, and then I think... So the, the audio out from the laptop, 
because it's an old laptop. It's old. I don't want to have to deal with software updating. So it's going to go out to a mixer, and then I line from the mixer to my USB interface to the main computer. That they take the the it takes the audio from that, and I should just be able to play, and it'll go. And that was so. Really good. How did you used to do it in your old house when I used to come over? Because you used I to have a, both of us and music all happening from your computer. Yes, I had um, an internal system using um, a, pl- a software called Soundflower, mm. and. I don't know what happened, but things just got there. There's all this latency that ended up happening, and just things got confused and discombobbled, and I just turned it all off because there started being people were complaining about there being too much delay between um, my audio and voice, and so. Oh, I do normal. remember that. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I want to get rid of the software. I love the software mixer solution, but it the delay did not work, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, R and Lore, why can't I just play it from the main computer? Because uh, Google Plus, the Hangouts do not, they don't pick it up. It picks up um, my USB interface audio, the microphone. But so, it's very, it's confusing. It's not just simple. And then also the it will be mono. I want things to be, my but my, so if I right now, I want people to, this is a test, this audio. So I'm going to see if this changes. I'm going to go to studio as opposed to just voice. And save settings. Do I want to swap the left and right stereo channels? What does that do? Anyway, I went to Let studio. Just, ah, don't change it. Right. Don't do that. That's weird. What just I'll happened? I'll swap it. <laughs> What just happened? Fix it. I don't like you're, it. I don't know, but you're all up in my right ear it now. It feels like you're like your mouth is right here in my ear. Oh Not god, in now you're in that one. one. Not in, <laughs> really in your left ear. <laughs> I really it's like you're a close talker and you're like right here in my ear and you're talking at normal volume. You're just like yeah. I can hear your breath in my ear. <laughs> Now you're normal. Oh my god, that was weird. That was, that was very strange. I did not enjoy that. I could tell. That was really funny. You have a beautiful voice. It just took me for granted, or it took me. It took me by surprise. By surprise. I can't talk. I'm done yes. talking apparently for the day. Yeah. The uh, yeah. So. Yes, my setup, this microphone, the setup, it is mono unless there's something in the stream that turns it into a stereo system. Um, And so there are all these weird things that happen. And so, yeah, the mic has to go into the mixer as well, says Mooncat. Well, I can do that, right? And then go from there into my USB interface, right? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever, but I just want some. I want somebody to do it for me, because every time I try and do it, it goes wrong. But anyway, it would be awesome to have the music seamless, and just be able to go doot, 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 doot. But it seemed to work all right today. It worked okay today. Yeah. Mhm. Yeah, it's just not the best audio quality, but that's okay. Is okay. It's so nice. Insider says, I want Dr. Kiki on my right ear and Blair Bass on my left. (laughs) Where does that put (laughs) Justin exactly? The voice of reason. The voice of reason. Yeah. External speakers. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, dear. External speakers, and then you have feedback. Not careful about setting it up. I've had that problem before. Um, what were some of the cool things? So pictures. I need pictures, you guys. Pick out your yes, favorite pictures. pictures, pictures send pictures, me an email pictures. with your favorite mm-hmm. pictures, numbers in it. Because um, mm-hmm. we're going to get pictures. New. We need new pictures up on the website. And I hear that Gord has written something awesome for Blair. So we'll get uh, get Blair into the mix of hosts on the website. And I'll get uh, Gord to get... Uh, get access to the website so we can write things. Um, what else are we missing? 
We have the promo, we have the things and the stuff, and I have a really, really, really big interview next Friday. For what? A job I applied for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a very, very big uh, deal interview next Friday. And I also have tickets to the Depeche Mode concert on <laughs> Thursday night. And I think I'm going to have to sell my Depeche Mode tickets. <gasps> and oh, no, I'm really sad about that. I really want to see Depeche Mode. But I don't want to drive. It's down in Mountain View. I would get home very late. And I have an important, important interview. So I would rather be here getting to bed at a more reasonable time, hanging out with you folks, talking science. Aww. And then I can sing I can sing Depeche Mode songs to myself and yeah. rock myself to sleep. Yeah. Enjoy the silence. I'm going to a show I, next weekend. I see don't imagine. I'm going to see what? I'm going to see Comedy Bang Bang. Comedy Bang awesome. Bang. Awesome. Comedy Bang Bang. Comedy Bang Bang. I'm really excited. I don't imagine that it would be too hard to unload those Depeche Mode tickets in San Francisco. Yeah, probably not. What is Comedy it. Bang Bang, Comedy Bang Bang, Comedy it's Bang? It's so comedy good. Podcast. It's a podcast. It's a comedy podcast, and they do live taping sometimes. And I went last year, and now I'm going again. It's my one year nice. of going. I'm going to try to make it a thing. <laughs> um, but basically, they have famous people on, and then they have – improv comedians come on and pretend to be someone else and they do this whole improvised hour long chat and it's amazing. Wow. Interesting. That would be a blast. I feel like I do that every week. <laughs> well, look for Comedy Bang Bang. It's <laughs> it's excellent. Don't we I do an improvised that. chat every week for about an hour? But we but I at least mm-hmm. am not pretending to be <clears throat> someone else. Ah, wait, at least. What do you mean? <laughs> I'm not the I, Do you see me wearing any makeup? Uh, am I am I wearing any makeup? Am I changing my appearance with makeup in any way? I'm, I mean, I'm what just, is that supposed to mean? No. Mm-hmm. All um, right. I have a babysit that yes, I know. Yes, yes, yes. You got to go. Uh, I, have to, uh, I have places to be. Uh, yes, I have a place to be called my bed. Yeah. Yes, Blair, Blair, you look very nice. I like your makeup today. Thank you. Someone went somewhere to help me figure out my makeup. So fancy. It's nice. <laughs> That's almost like I'm a professional. Almost. almost. Because you are. <laughs> You're a pro. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here for Twists Live. And we will be back next week. Um, And, uh, you know, share the links. Share the love. Help us make $19. (laughs) Beware of pandas. (laughs) And beware of pandas. That's right. right. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Bye. It's on your head.